right, should I remove myself and come back? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Ball, and I'm a librarian in the Business and Economics Department at Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to today's program, Capital Commitments for Your Small Business. This program is brought to you by the library and SCORE Los Angeles. Before we start the presentation, just wanna go over a few, a few things, housekeeping items. First of all, we are recording. So if you can't stay until the end, or if you miss any portion of the presentation, it will be available for you to watch here on the library's YouTube channel. Also, we will be having a short Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we welcome your questions. In order to submit a question, you will need to be signed into YouTube, and then you can just type your question into the comment box at any time during the presentation. And so with that out of the way, I am now very pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Stephanie Ardry. Dr. Ardry has more than 25 years experience of building profitable ventures in sectors such as entertainment, real estate, and finance. In founding the Ardry Group, a more than 250 million joint venture marketing and communications firm with offices in seven states, she became a leader in multicultural advertising. Her clients have included the California Department of Health Services, Bank of America, the Golden State Warriors, and numerous, numerous others. Dr. Ardry, AKA Dr. Money, is also the author of Show Me the Money, The Three Ps to Profit. And she is an adjunct professor at UCLA and Cal State Los Angeles. She has trained thousands of entrepreneurs on business planning and strategic growth especially advising them on debt and equity strategies. And I'd like to now turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Ardry. Welcome and thank you for being here. Oh, Danielle, thank you so much for having me. I think I shared that I have such fond memories of not only bringing entrepreneurs to the Los Angeles Public Library, uh, but spending time there myself. It's one of my happy places and definitely where I spend time whenever I'm doing business research. So I'm excited, everyone, to be with you today. And uh, we're going to jump right in. So today we're going to discuss capital commitments, uh, which is one of, again, my favorite topics. Uh, so as Danielle shared, I uh, am the CEO of Blue Diamond Group, but most recently in the last few years, as a result of the global uh, pandemic, I had an opportunity to launch what I say is my legacy business, and that is in the wellness space. I created an asset class called Medispatels, and so we are uh, developing wellness resorts and farming. Uh, op operations around the globe. In fact, I am in uh, the Oxford area of London presently looking at a honey farm that will become part of our business portfolio. So more about that later. But again, excited to be with you all today. Okay, so our agenda is I'm first going to lay a foundation about capital, uh, because a lot of times people throw terms around without fully understanding, you know, what does that really mean? So we're going to talk a little bit about what capital is, what it means, and why it's essential for financing your business. I'm going to touch on a few key highlights regarding the Jobs Act and why it's important for your small business we're going to also discuss how seed capital is a valuable part of bootstrapping your company early on. And then I'm going to share the distinctions between a Series A, B, and C funding round. I'm going to tell you what you should include in a pitch deck. And I'm going to share with you a sample pitch deck that was prepared by Mint. In fact, it was their pitch deck that successfully allowed them to raise their capital commitments. And then I'm gonna share a last few tips about what you wanna consider when we talk about exit, exiting the business. And of course, there's opportunity for questions and answer. And feel free to share your questions and answers as we go along. All right, so let's get started. So when we talk about financing a business, I often say that it's important to really structure, if you will, a wide net of possibilities. And the reason being is that not all capital 
is the same. And not all capital does the same thing, but most importantly, depending upon where you are in the stage of developing your business, not all capital costs the same. And as an entrepreneur, that's something that you want to understand. What are the costs of the particular capital? And what are the benefits of using one source of capital over another source of capital? And so we're going to go through a few of those. All right. So capital versus cash. That comes up as well. I have entrepreneurs who say, hey, I'm not going to get any outside capital. I'm going to operate my business just relying upon the cash that I'm generating in my business. But let me tell you why that's limiting. It's believe it or not, there are opportunities that are presented when you're operating your business. It might be an opportunity for you to advertise your business at a discount. It might be an opportunity to gain the inventory or the raw materials that you need. And if you're only able to rely upon the cash from the operations of your business, you might find yourself in a situation where you have limited access to capital at a very critical time. So cash from your operations is not the recommended course of action when you're going about growing a company. And again, we're planning to grow our companies, right? That's why we launched them. We want them to grow. We want them to be successful. And we want to ultimately have some type of value at the end of all of the hard work that goes into building a venture. Trust me, I know. So even Guy Kawasaki shared a, a, a statement that everything is about cash, raising it, conserving it, and collecting it, guys. And don't forget that oftentimes the number one cause of business failure is a cash crisis. And that is because oftentimes what happens is the cash that was available to the venture was utilized first before the entrepreneur or the leaders of the business realize that they should have been anticipating and preparing and building other relationships so that there'd be other options uh, for capital. And it takes time in order to raise capital. So what I want you to understand is that there's three different uh, types of capital. Typically we have our fixed capital. That's the capital that we're going to use if we need to purchase buildings or if we have equipment or land, you know, uh, fixed types of investments that are necessary for the business. You have working capital and that's what you use when you're dealing with meeting wages, paying bills, operational, needs. And then you have growth capital. If it is you're planning to scale your organization, you're going to need a number of resources available so that you can intensify your marketing efforts. Maybe you need to staff up in order to build your capacity so that you can then grow your organization. So all of those things are important in understanding, first of all, what type of capital do I need? And then where should I go to get it? So as we begin to think about the capital, you want to first ask yourself, how much do I believe I need? What is the plan? How do I plan to use that capital? Meaning we have usually a use of funds summary that I have every entrepreneur create that says, I'm going to spend, I need $50,000 in capital and I'm going to spend 10,000 of that on advertising. I'm going to spend 5,000 of that on computer equipment. I'm going to spend another 3,000 on something else and so on and so forth, right? So once you've identified all of these allocations for the capital that you believe that you need, then we look at based upon those needs, what are the best sources for the capital for those particular uses. So whenever I look at a use of funds summary and I see capital that's going to be allocated towards things that are fixed, like lands, like office, like equipment, then immediately I pull those items off of the equity bucket and say, let's go and use debt sources because those items in and of themselves serve as collateral. So if you're an early stage company, especially when capital is difficult, you want to use anything that you can that will serve as collateral 
to allow you to capitalize the business because as we'll discuss later, when we get into equity, equity costs you more than debt. So we'll break that down in a little bit. But also, when you're looking at the sources, you want to understand the terms, and then you also want to plan the exit for that capital. And so what I mean by that is you want to have a plan to recapitalize that capital. So if you have a term loan, and say you got that term loan in the last six months, then you know that the prime rate for commercial financing has increased in the U.S. And that's created a trickle effect around the world because many markets set their markets off of the prime rate in the U.S. Um, for example, I mentioned I'm in the U.K. I was reading the business section last night as I arrived and noticed that in the U.K., the fact that the U.S. has raised the prime rate, now investors are shifting their dollars back into the U.S. market because that means they can earn a greater return. Um, the U.S. had been positioning itself, repositioning itself following the Great Recession and then the global pandemic. And as a result of that, the interest rate had been held low, which meant that for investors, they can't earn money by having their money parked in the banks. So they began to look at other alternatives in terms of where they could seek their money so that that money can make money. Now that the interest rates are increasing, that makes it attractive for investors, again, to place their money in the U.S. market. Okay. So when we talk about debt, what we're talking about are capital sources that is repaid based on interest. You don't give up any ownership when it is you use debt financing. It's carried as a liability on the company's balance sheet. And although it can appear to be difficult, it's only difficult if you're not aware of the proper sources for that particular capital. So what happens is oftentimes a very new entrepreneur will go to their bank and typically, if they've not been running a business, the bank that they have, the relationship that they have is really not the best relationship. You typically have a retail relationship because you've been a consumer at the bank. So you'll go to some of these larger banks. And unfortunately, because your business is so small and it's unproven, the bank turns you down. And that's because the bank's don't take a lot of unnecessary risk and especially risk on early stage companies, which is why it's so important to build those relationships long before you need them. And like I say, you want to have three to five different banking relationships for different purposes, depending upon your growth needs for your organization. So you really want to spend some time understanding and thinking about your capital requirements before you start, if you will, seeking a capital. Next, understanding these sources. So what are some of the sources? So I said banks. Not all banks are the same. That's why it's important to understand banking relationships. So you have your big uh, global banks. And oftentimes, again, depending upon the size and scale of your organization, you may be just too small initially to really get a fair shake with some of these larger global banks unless you're doing international business and that becomes a unique requirement. Um, but typically I encourage entrepreneurs to become familiar with the state and regional banks that tend to be more interested in supporting the small businesses. Uh, governmental agencies, there's community development financial institutions that serve as another organization and touch point for capitalizing, especially early stage organizations. If you find that your business is located in a rural community, for example, you may look to the USDA, which offers financing for rural-based organizations. Most for-profit organizations are not going to be recipients of grants, but since the global pandemic, the Small Business Administration, as well as numerous other organizations, decided to make grants available 
for for-profit organizations to get those businesses back on track. So at this time, there are a number of granting organizations that although they normally would not have grants available, they are offering grants. So look out for some of those opportunities as well. An often missed opportunity is corporate credit. And so building your organization so that you, it's attractive to begin to develop corporate credit is a big area, it's a big gap that's often missed. And that's an area that I'd say is very important to explore and consider. Another area to consider are insurance policies. And insurance policies in the context of business, if you are a solopreneur or if you have a team and the small team are valuable to the organization, then I encourage you to look into key man policies. And these are insurance policies where you provide a policy on the key principles of the organization. And then those policies also serve as collateral that can help the company company in capitalizing the venture. And then there's different types of special economic zones, other incentives, tax credits, opportunity zones and funds, and other things that cities and municipalities may make available when it is they're looking to stimulate economic development. So look out for those opportunities as well. All right. And so there's, again, an assortment of type of banks and banking relationships. And so you really want to understand based on where your business is along its growth. So its phase, phase of development, as well as the size of the capital commitment that you're seeking will influence which of these relationships become the best for you. As I mentioned, the Community Development Financial Institution, these are funds that are allocated towards companies that may be harder to finance early on. So these funds are typically available, look at your state governments um, to see where there might be a CDFI backed organization that has funds available. They typically lend smaller amounts. So if your business needs under a hundred thousand or under two hundred thousand dollars in capital, then typically CDFI funds are the source of kind of those micro type loans and financing products. The Small Business Administration, so SBA.gov, has both information on grants. And the SBA has been offering direct loan programs. Uh, they offered the EIDL loans, which were direct loan programs that the SBA facilitated. And the um, payroll protection program was the program that was instituted, that was facilitated through the banking relationships. Typically, the SBA, instead of serving as a direct lender, serves as a guarantor to help, again, early stage companies secure financing from commercial banks by guaranteeing up to 90% of the loan to mitigate the bank's risk. And so that's usually where the SBA would be supported. So if you're looking to buy an existing business, you want to buy a franchise, or if you're looking to buy a building or buy real estate, or if you have to invest in sizable equipment or you need to invest in tenant improvements. So my restaurant clients that are typically building out a restaurant, uh, those are typically structured under 10 year uh, type lease agreements, often with landlords or a minimum of a five year lease agreement with one or two five year options. Uh, it requires that length of investment for the SBA uh, to be willing to uh, make loan against a leased relationship, uh, which is different than a property that you're looking to acquire. All right, so here are a few things about why the JOBS Act of 2012 was so important. Uh, what the JOBS Act did was made the ability to raise capital a little bit more accessible for, again, smaller businesses and businesses in particular needing to raise or with revenues under a billion dollars. And the reason being is when you hear about a company 
planning to go out to the public markets and raise capital, there is a significant lead time that's required and a lot of capital, believe it or not, to hire the investment bankers, to put together the legal team. Uh, you have to have an effective business plan that then has to be re uh, interpreted into a private placement memorandum by your securities team. So there's a number of steps involved and all of those stages of that process require a, a hefty investment. And so it's important to understand that the taking a company public, you have to invest so much on the front end to ensure one, that it can meet all of the federal requirements and reporting requirements. Uh, and so the job Jobs Act aim to mitigate that process and make it easier for smaller businesses to be able to step outside their friends and family, but to be able to do so and understand how to go about getting access to crowdfunding platforms and mechanisms and using what are considered mini IPO type tools that are more micro, you'd say, in their scale and scope. And the goal was to, again, to stimulate small businesses, because what most people may or may not know is that the U.S. is really run by small businesses. And so when we support small businesses, small businesses are the first employers typically within their communities. And so that was a lot of the thinking behind the Jobs Act as well as hopefully, again, finding ways to mitigate some of the risk, because oftentimes the reason that small investors had not been allowed to invest is that there was significant concern around fraudulent activities and people misrepresenting an investment opportunity to potentially unsophisticated investors. So that's what this has been about. All right. So let's take it a little bit further. Equity. Equity is what is considered securities. That is what the owners gain when they create a business. Um, the three Fs, friends, family, and sometimes fools who make an early investments. And then angels, high net worth individual, family offices, which are offices that manage the money of wealthy families, venture capital, and institutional investors. And those layers of investors, again, look at organizations that are mature and continue to have an opportunity for growth. All right, so when we talk about equity, we're talking about the personal investment in the business. And it's basically the capital that's at risk because when you are a shareholder in the business, if the business fails, you're wiped out. If you're a debt holder in the business and the business fails, there's a possibility if there's assets that are liquidated that you might recover some of the capital. But in equity, typically you're basically wiped out. But different than debt, equity is not repaid like interest on a loan. What it means is that you've given up an ownership interest in the company. And those owners, though, as well, seek a return and they want some type of liquidity event to basically allow them to realize that return. So usually if you're early stage business and you bring an early stage capital, like from friends and family or from angel investors, their goal is to have their capital work in your business for about three years. Um, sometimes up to five, but usually their sweet spot is about three years. And then they want you to have some ability to create a liquidity event so that they can then now get their equity investment back along with the return on investment. And so the reason that I say equity is expensive is you pay about 30 to 40% for each of those dollars, because at that time, your business is considered at its highest level of risk. And so the capital is going to cost you the most. So that's why there's a tightrope dance of how much capital you want to secure when your business is at its earliest stage, because it's costing you the most. So seed capital. Uh, this is where you're looking at pre-seed funding in some cases. And so 
What I uh, recently uh, did was uh, Zeniverse, my new wellness company. I have been working on building that particular business for about 15 years. But some of the market variables that I needed were not quite right. So right before the global uh, pandemic, I decided to go to law school. And so I was in law school and everything shut down. And so like many folks, I looked for a way to finish up and just, you know, do my work and came up with the bright idea. Instead of sitting at home, I would go to Jamaica. And so I ended up spending most of the, uh, two years of law school, the remaining two years of law school between Jamaica and London and launching a, a brand new company. But I had to bootstrap it because knowing capital the way that I did, I really wanted to develop my IP portfolio, develop my ideas, assemble a team, validate my consumer market opportunities, and really have things that I could count as assets before I went to the market to start talking about funding. Because the more that I had that I was able to figure out how to create, you know, bootstrapping wise would mean that I'd have more value. Um, rather than just a business plan, I could have some actual tangible assets that I could share. Uh, and then the seed funding round, I was able to uh, use a convertible note instrument to get friends and family to provide what would be basically debt financing, a loan to my business made by my friends and family early on to get me far enough along before I would go out to um, a seed, a true seed round where I had an outside investor make an investment in the business. And so typically the problem is a lot of people are pitching or hearing conversations about raising capital, but oftentimes they're not even ready for capital because if you haven't had a conversation with a securities attorney who's been able to look at your business plan and advise you on where your business falls under the SEC regulations, then you're not even ready. And also you must understand that if you solicit without understanding the requirements of solicitation for investment in your business, you could find yourself um, in securities, having uh, con um, participated in securities fraud. And so you don't wanna go down a path and find yourself in trouble um, innocently just because you didn't understand that that's what you're asking. If you're asking for somebody to put capital in your business and they're not giving it to you as a loan, they're investing and they're going to have an ownership business in your business and they're not in the business operating the business with you, then now you're dealing with security. And so you must get advice from a securities attorney to make sure that you go through that process appropriately. So around uh, after you deal with a, a, a seed round, uh, typically you're going to go to a series A round. And what the purpose for the series A round is after the seed round, the seed is the earliest stage of the business. So maybe you're trying to prove or produce a minimum viable product if you're producing some type of product um, or you want to demonstrate that you can get to market and get initial market traction if it is you're in a service business. And once you've sort of perfected your model and gotten some market traction, then you want to take out those early investors and provide them with a return on investment as well as recapitalize for the next phase of growth. And that's where you'd go into your series A. Now you've got a great idea. You've demonstrated that you have a strong strategy, a team that's able to execute the business plans, as well as you have solid knowledge of the market and opportunity. And you need about up to $50 million is typically around the range of where you're looking when you're raising a series A round. Uh, your series B is when you now you've, you've matched the A, you've taken the market, now you're back to another round of capital. Um, you're looking to 
recapitalize the business again. And so you need to go ahead and gain another round of funding so that you can take the business to its next level of scalability and tee up for a particular a Series C. You don't always go from A through C or D. It really depends upon the type of business that you're operating and how capital intensive it is to operate that particular business. But usually when you get to the higher rounds like the Series C or the Series D, it means that the company is teeing up potentially to go public. And so you're bringing in all of the capital that you need to really perfect the business and you're going to be marketing the business to hedge funds, to investment banks, to private equity firms, and other secondary type market groups in order to bring that capital forward because they're really looking for 100x you know, for that business. They see a huge market opportunity uh, for bringing it to market and scale. All right. So when you're raising capital, depending upon the amount of capital that you believe you need, it can be really a challenge because oftentimes the numbers between 100,000 and 3 million are too small, but that's usually about the sweet spot on the average of what a small business requires is somewhere in that 100,000 to 3 million range. And so that's kind of a difficult thing because uh, if you're going out to say, you know, a hedge fund, if you, you got lucky enough to have a conversation with a hedge fund or if you were trying to talk to someone, you know, VCs, those organizations are teed up to not even consider an investment under $10 million often. I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day and he says, hey, I've got another fund. There's an opportunity, but you need a minimum of a $20 million ask. So you can't ask for $20 million if you don't have the ability to deploy $20 million and to turn that $20 million into, you know, say a $200 million value of the business, you know, in terms of a return. So you want to be aware of not only your capital requirements, but where it is you're able to scale your organization, because that's an important part of the capital. And so there are several networks. I've identified a few that I think may be good starters. So there's Angel Investors Network. There's Gust that has a number of tools available. There's Angel.co. Um, there's F6S. And there's more. So this is not an exhaustive list. These are just a few of my favorites that you can check out and learn a little bit more about that early stage type of capital from the equity standpoint. But as it relates to exit, I'm always saying you have to be aware of and plan for an exit. That means that you want to exit the capital that has been placed in the business. Any investor that's investing in the business is making an investment because they're looking to get a return on that investment. And the way that they realize that return is through some type of liquidity event. So if it is your plans are to build up your business and then sell it, then that's the liquidity event. So you'd be looking at multiples of what those businesses trade for at that stage of maturity to determine the value. Maybe you're building a business that would be a perfect acquisition target for a larger concern, but they don't want to spend the time building the new innovation or the new product, but they'd be a great target for you as an exit. You want to have that in your mind on the front end, because guess what? If you don't have that planned and you build the business and you haven't built the infrastructure in such a way that makes it attractive for an acquisition target, when it comes time for either that sell or that merger and acquisition, your business will be discounted because now the acquirer has to go back and fix the business so that they can acquire it and fold it into their organization. So you want to understand those things. Another opportunity is to take the company public. So if it is that the company has the wherewithal and means to go public, then you could go through the traditional channels of the investment banks and taking it public. I didn't list, but there's another tool you can use, a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company. And what a SPAC is, is a company that has previously been 
a publicly traded company. And for whatever reason, the, the venture was shelved, but that company can be cleaned up and repurposed to acquire and then do a reverse merger to ultimately take your business public. And then the last opportunity, which hopefully you don't end up here, is to unfortunately, the business is obsolete. It can no longer be capitalized. So you have to look at dissolution. So then you're looking to see how you can sell off the assets for some value at that point. All right. So how do we determine some of these things? Some of these determinants are made by understanding your organization. So there's a couple things that I suggest that you have available kind of in your back pocket at all time. One is the ability to put together a quick SWOT. What are the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats? And oftentimes this is done inappropriately. So let me tell you what we're looking for. When we talk about strengths and weaknesses, these are internal. So a lot of times what I encourage companies or entrepreneurs to do is think across your value chain. That means the internal functions of your organization's finance, technology, marketing, product production, you know, basically all of the functions within your organization that allow you to bring your product or service from concept to the consumer. All of those stages internally are what make up the strengths and weaknesses of the organization. External to the organization are opportunities and threats. So opportunities would be things like, I'll tell you, someone called me and said they were looking to go into um, medical transportation business. And I said, okay, great. So one market that you might be exploring is a market for seniors where there may be mobility impairments. And that might be the primary market that you're targeting. And he said, yes. I said, however, there's a growing market that you may not have considered. And that is sadly, when we look at the obesity and the fact of how obesity in the US and the world actually is impacting mobility, then that is causing people to find themselves in need of mobility support for doctor's appointments or things of that nature either um, that are clogging up the traditional system, the ambulance system where you're responding to non-emergency just because a person is unable to facilitate their mobility requirements because they are no longer able to move around in a vehicle or move themselves. So that's another market opportunity because there's growth in this particular area. And then there are threats. So a threat would be something like um, all right, I'm going into medical transport and the gas prices increased, or should I be looking at going electric? What would that do to my business or opportunity? I won't be able to control the price of gas. I won't be able to control my ability to have access to electricity beyond the electrical unit that I set up at my business or at my residence. How will I make sure that I have access to charging stations along the routes at a, in a reasonable amount of time when I'm a facilitating the transport. So again, those are external things that may, what are the regulatory changes that are being enacted that may be coming up in the next three to five years? And how will these impact my business as well? Are all considerations that are external that you wanna be aware of. All right, and so your company must have a solid business model. And so after you've looked at the strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities and threats, then you begin to determine what you believe you have as competitive initiatives. They are articulated in the form of the business model's value proposition. And how do you plan to approach business so that you ensure that you can not only execute your business plans, but that you can do so and produce a profit. 
Because remember, at the end of the day, you must be able to produce a profit if you expect for your organization to be sustainable. Uh, because if you're running in the red indefinitely, it's not going to succeed. Um, because you can't run in the red indefinitely. You must get to profitability at some point. All right. So the magic question, I'm thinking about a pitch deck. What's important? It's important to be able to illustrate what is the vision of the organization? What is the organization going to look like when it's operating at its desired? Everything is sort of you know, figured out and it's operating like a fine tuned machine, what does it look like? Um, what is the mission? Meaning why does this organization exist and why will it continue to exist? I'll tell you as a young entrepreneur, I was fascinated by IBM and other organizations that had existed for hundreds of years beyond the original founder's life. So, because what that meant was those businesses were formed with such a valuable infrastructure that the leadership could continue to reposition or pivot where necessary based on business market cycles and variables, demographic shifts, you know, geographical shifts, all of those things. And that the business had solid core values, a long-term belief system and principles that not only guide how employees operate within that organization, but the stakeholders that support the business, both internal and external to the organization. So I'm going to run you through quickly an investment deck. This investment deck was prepared by Mint. Um, and this was the deck that was utilized to successfully fund and launch Mint. So we call the first page the real estate. So this real estate illustrates the company and the tagline, take back your wallet. That was the mission. So the solution statement, Mint says that they could save you time and money. And so they began to illustrate how they plan to do that. Who's leading the organization? Because when the business is new, the team is what the investors are banking on. And so investors often say, we don't bet on the horse. We bet on the jockey, which means the horse, the business might change. The business might need to pivot. But the team needs to be smart enough to recognize that because that's who we're betting on. And so that's why you make a mistake when you think that it's your business that you're in love with and that an investor is in love with. They're not in love with the business. They're in love with the execution of those business plans and being able to do so for a profit. That's what they're in love with. That's why they're investors. OK, so market shots. A lot of time here is where entrepreneurs get excited and say, oh, I've identified this significant market. But remember, you're not going to own 100% of any market. So you want to be able to recognize what the market is that you believe you see. But really, what is the market that your business is going to be able to address? Your addressable market is what we're interested in understanding. And who are the competitors? Here's a mistake oftentimes that entrepreneurs fail is they fail to spend enough time shopping and understanding the competitive landscape. You must know your market. Don't go and present your business to investors because remember, investors typically invest in spaces they know. And because they're investors, they're hearing thousands of pitches a year. So chances are they've already heard something similar to a spin on. If they've been doing it as long as I've been in business over 40 years, man, I've heard a little bit of everything. So I know more about your business oftentimes than you do. So I also know when you're not prepared. And that's an embarrassing thing. You will not get investment if you show up unprepared. 
what are the benefits? What's in it for them? In this case, Mint is offering their product solution in a business to consumer market. And so here they're illustrating the benefits, what's in it for them, what's in it for those consumers who would be interested in using their product. And then also there are additional benefits to who they've identified as their partners. That's the business to business relationship. So being able to illustrate if there is a business to business relationship, those opportunities as well. And then what's your go to market strategy? How are you going to get to market? What are you going to do to launch? How are you planning to grow? And how are you planning to defend the business in a mature market? Because yes, you will be competing and you will be defending. Because even if you come to market with a brilliant new product, guess what? If it's brilliant and it's new, someone else is going to go, oh, that's a great idea. Let me go ahead and copy and participate in that market. You can't stop competition, but what you want to do is be aware of it and continue to deliver on your value proposition. That's what your customers are looking for. What is the value that you're offering? If you truly deliver on that value, I'll continue to be your customer. So what is that business model that you've put in place to begin to not only get to market, but how are you going to make money? That's what a business model is illustrating. And then what are the risks? Because in every business, there are risks. And how do you plan to mitigate those risks? At least what is your thought process about mitigating those risks? And then again, how are you going to respond to the various competitors? Because again, they will be there and they are going to look at ways to unseat you if possible. So how do you plan to defend your business in the marketplace? And then what are your financial assumptions? Don't send someone a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers without illustrating uh, or providing a notes to those financial assumptions so that someone could understand what you're basing your numbers on. That's what an investor is interested in understanding, your assumptions. And then being able to illustrate the financials, where you see the business going over the first three to five years. Um, usually three is sufficient early on. And then what you're uh, promising um, as the internal rate of return for the investors in terms of their investment at that stage of the business. And then exit. How do you plan to deliver an exit for those investors so that they can recoup the money that they have placed in the business? At what time will they see that exit and at what amounts of exit will be generated so that they can exit their venture, your venture? And so here in this case, Mint illustrated potential acquisition targets, um, Google, Yahoo, Intuit, and Microsoft as potential M&A or acquisition targets. So that was the strategy for their exit. All right. So here again are some of the references that I have articulated a share throughout the presentation. And here is your opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ardrey, for the presentation. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, to our viewers, um, it is not too late to submit a question. Uh, drop it into that comment box. Um, but for now, I, uh, we do have a few questions, Dr. Ardrey, for you. Um, okay. All right. So let me start with, um, can I ask anyone for money? Aha, and that's a good question. Well, no. <laughs> you can ask your friends and family initially, but you're only asking them for a loan, right? If it is that you want to speak with someone who is outside of your friend and family, like an unsolicited, somebody that you read in the newspaper, you read, you, okay, this is a high net worth individual. Don't do it. 
until you've had a conversation with a securities attorney. Because if you speak about your business before you know the appropriate regulation, you may have prevented yourself from using it. So then when you go back and want to correctly present your business, you may find that you've disqualified your business from being able to utilize a particular regulation because you've already discussed your business before you were given permission to do so. Great. Thank you. Okay. Another question. How can my family support my venture? Now, that's a great one. A lot of times we think that we don't want to include our family in our business, but our family really investors want proof that you have people who believe in you and who else to go to people that know you should be able to support you. So what I did in, in my most recent venture is I had a family dinner and I presented my business and my initial partner to my family as well as had them have an opportunity to see some of what we were doing. And from that, my family was interested in participating in a seed round. And so I had a convertible note that had been created by an attorney. And I explained what that convertible note was and encouraged my family members to speak with an attorney to get their own understanding as well. And then at that point, it was okay for my family to participate by loaning money to my business to help me get started. As well as using their social media, their networks, their contacts, and helping to expand awareness. Okay, excellent. So another question here, which type of capital is better, debt or equity? So again, it depends. I always say that you need a little bit of both. Equity costs you the most. So you want to really be prudent, you know, when you interject equity in the space. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the company Angie's List uh, that's now become Angie. Um, Unfortunately, because of her journey to capitalize the business from the beginning, by the time the business went public, Angie owned the least amount of the business and had to continue to work. You know, my corporate attorney tells a similar story that he built a company and by the time it went public, he received something, but not enough he had to go and practice law. And so he says he's an advocate for entrepreneurs to hopefully help you do it better than he did it. If you exit, you hope to retire from that exit and not have to go and get another job. So you want to be careful. Debt to me is preferred if you can get the debt because debt is just that. It's debt and you pay interest and your interest is tax deductible. And that's easy peasy. As long as you can support the debt, as long as you can cash flow and support the debt, I would pick debt over equity nine times out of 10. Okay, great, thank you. All right, and then uh, another one here. Um, I don't want to exit my business. Is this a requirement for capital? So you don't have to exit the business, but if you've taken in capital, from in some form, the capital would like for you to recapitalize in some form by creating a liquidity event. And that could be right. if you took in equity, say for example, early on because you needed to, but now you've established the business and you've become you've worked on those banking relationships that I've encouraged you to develop. And now you have banks that will allow you to refinance your business and take out those equity shareholders and now use debt, buy back your shares. You hear this when you see your companies that have maybe been uh, publicly traded and they buy back the shares and become privately held again. That's what they've done is they've created a liquidity event to gain back the ownership in the business. So the exit is really about exiting the capital, recapitalizing the venture. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm just checking real quick to make sure there's no other comments or questions from the viewers. And it does look like we've um, answered everything. Again, that was excellent, Dr. Ardry. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was really fun to have someone who's uh, been so successful to share your insight. Um, yeah, so 
Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to our viewers. Remember that uh, this presentation will uh, be living here on YouTube, uh, the library's YouTube channel. So uh, to our viewers, please come back and rewatch it. If you uh, want to gain more insight, uh, need to go back and uh, get a little bit more um, information that you might have missed, it will be here for you. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ardry, for being here with us. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. And because I do it for SCORE as well, I will put up my email address just in case there's a question. And if so, you know, please don't hesitate. Just in your subject, say that you saw the presentation uh, with the Los Angeles Public Library, and then I'll know who you are. And I'd be happy to answer. Oh, I guess I can't advance. It looks like I stopped the slide. So anyway, so anyway, if there is if there's a need, you can uh, do, I thought it was on there. Let's see. Anyway, if there's an email, you can direct it in my direction. I'll be happy to answer it email okay. as well. Yeah. Um, anybody, uh, I have my email up on screen here. You can, uh, email me here at the library and I can direct any questions where it needs to go. You mentioned SCORE. They are a great program, uh, mentorship program program nationwide. Um, I've added the link to the Los Angeles chapter um, for everybody. So um, again, we are just about out of time. Thank you so much again. And I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you again for having me.